This morning we had the Sunday School class on devouring God's Word. And it's a rebuke to all of us because we've all probably at times read more and devoured more and memorized more and meditated more than we are today due to the busyness of time and the, the projects and some people's travels and some people's uh, endeavors and new jobs and everything takes precedence, the tyranny of the urgent. And yet I, I would trust... Um, uh, that as we think through the day, we had the message this morning about walking, walking uh, the right walk for God and taking the right steps. And so I, I looked at my sermon, which I had already titled because I had done it ahead of time. I started thinking about this Wednesday after the very good message on Wednesday night. And I just thought that Folks that are missing out uh, because of whatever, uh, some people can't get home in time, that's, that's not a whatever. A whatever is, I feel a little bit tired. Then you're missing out on a great blessing on Wednesday night, not only a time of prayer that we break up and pray, but just the good, uh, the good word of God that Pastor Rogers was sharing. And so it came to my mind that the, that the word of God was precious, and the Word of God was uh, uh, personal. It was not like a dogma that we come and talk about the, the Baptist dogma, you know, the, the doctrines. That are, these are personal, personal messages to our heart. And I said it was proven. So I did, that just came off my, uh, off my thoughts as I was listening to the, the good message Wednesday night. And so I kind of worked that into a message, and then it went right along with his message this morning. Now, don't put pressure on us that our messages have to coordinate, because we don't talk about it. It's just that we have, do have the same Holy Spirit, okay? But I don't know that he does that on every time. I don't think so, but unless you're doing your own messages, then you can, then you can carry it over. But um, I would rather than just after having thought about devouring the word this morning and then taking the right steps and then, uh, and then this afternoon the riches of his word is saying, oh, I need to do more. I would, I would rather look something like this. I'm going to, if I look into the word this week, I'm going to read God's love letter to me. And I can tell you just a little bit about that. Uh, when I was uh, trying to win Jody, Miss Jody, working very diligently, most of y'all know that I had bought the ring a year before I even asked her to marry me. It took me that long to pay for it. And, um, and so I, I had been paying it on the layaway plan, you know, and then I had finally paid it off and I, and I asked her, she says, I didn't ask her three times. I can remember three times and finally the third time was a charm. But, um, but meanwhile, in that period of time there, it kind of looked bad. So I said, well, I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to find somebody else. I'm going to find a young lady at the Christian college that I really admire and that I really respect because I'm going into the ministry and I and Jody's dragging her feet and and, you know, whatever, uncertain, waiting for a lightning bolt from heaven, you know. And so uh, so I talked to another girl and and it and I told her exactly the story. I said, I asked her to marry me. And she said, no, can you believe? No, I, I said, no, you can believe it. Yes, you can believe it. But I said, but it doesn't look like it's going to go anywhere. And I said, I, of the, everybody in the whole school, I respect you. Second. Now, that's a tough message to tell anybody, you know. I mean, that's, that's, what could I say? I told her the truth, okay? But I said, I would like to get to know you. I didn't know about courting, but I said, I would like to get to know you and just spend some time with you and talk to you and, and just see if things would go forward. Kind of like courting, but I didn't know the term. And so, meanwhile, Jody starts writing me some letters back. She starts waking up a little bit. And then Laura is writing some letters to me. So I would come to my little mailbox. Mmm. <laughs> And I'd say, that one's Laura, and that was Jody, you know? And so, uh, just for a little window of time, little window of time, 
I was getting these um, letters and uh, she was waking up to the fact that uh, that God may be in this thing and I, I kept Laura right on top I said I'm not using you and she her friends he's just using you no I wasn't I was honestly seeking to meet somebody else that you know was awake <laughs> you know that would wake up and uh, and so uh, to be to show you how how it worked out because y'all I'm sure some are wondering is I actually went to Laura to tell her I'm gonna ask Jody to marry me a third time and uh, a third time and so I told Laura, I said, Laura, I said, I've really enjoyed getting to know you. And she came to me uh, months later and she said, you know, uh, I'm engaged. Said this fellow that I've been, he was the student body president or something. And she said, we'd kind of, you know, stop for a while and said, because you were so honest, telling me exactly what you were trying to do with uh, God's leading. She said, I, I learned from that and we've been talking and now we're engaged too. And so great guy. So there for a while, I was actually the recipient of these letters and it was kind of exciting. And so I'd like, to, I'd like for us to go away from today to say, uh, number one, I want to take another step for God, that, that Pastor Rogers, I want to take, take another step, even if it's a baby step. Or from the Sunday school this morning, I, I'm reading my Bible or I'm reading my devotion book, and I, but I'm going to memorize a verse. I'm going to find a, a verse that jumps out and I'm going to memorize something from my own heart. Or you might say, I'm going to really devour the word and take a challenge like I did with my son uh, from Africa that said, uh, boy, this guy that I just heard, he reads through his, his New Testament every month and Psalms and Proverbs. You could even divide that in half and read it every two months and then it would only be about six pages of New Testament a day. And you could say, you know, I could replace just some useless time because I'm gonna get a love letter that's going to really smell good because it's God's word to me. Amen. So I'd like to preach a message on the riches of the word of God that was just on my heart from Wednesday from the message that uh, was preached at prayer meeting. And if you can come, uh, we, we, the Lord's been blessing on Wednesday night. First of all, I'd like to, for us to turn to Romans chapter 3. And I could go in a lot of places. I'm going to go to several just to show this. They're kind of disjointed, but showing one point. And the first thing is that the Word of God is personal. It's personal. It, it's got your name right here in this book. It, it knows you. God knows you, and He will tailor His, His Word by the Holy Spirit to be personal to you. And, and that's the first thing I want to think about is that it's personal. In Romans chapter 3, if we're learning about our sin problem, it says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not everybody, right? No, not what? One. It, it, it's personal. It comes down to the very need of the sinner. There's, there's, he's concerned about every one of us. He's not willing that any or anyone should perish, but that we should all come to repentance. So God is concerned about the individual and he wrote a book that's for you and for me. And so when I sit down to read this week, he's going he's to have a message just, just for me. Look in John, go back to John, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and chapter 3. Just, just some, like I said, these are not necessarily coordinated other than the fact that it's showing that God knows us. He says, chapter 3 and verse 3, it says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. So salvation is... Salvation is very personal, and the Word of God is very personal to our need for salvation. Uh, there is no household salvation in the term of, uh, other than the fact that good parents can train their children, but their salvation does not carry over. Every youngster 
must be born again. Every child and daughter of a pastor or a missionary must have a personal one-on-one -on -one encounter with God and many miss that because they hear it all their lives and they're around the Word of God and it's just second nature and yes I want to get go to heaven I'm, I'm, am I crazy reminded me of the the missionary that the, the aviation missionary that we're that we're helping that gave his testimony and they were witnessing to him as a teenage boy you guys can appreciate this. They, the, 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 the van, he went to church and the evangelist took him to, to get some pie after church. And so the evangelist over there and he's saying, he's saying a verse like that. Uh, There's none righteous, no not one. And he bought him a big piece of pie and ice cream, you know, blue bell on top of it. And, and the guy's eating his pie. And he says, he says, he says, there's none righteous, no not one or all have sin. He said, do you understand that? And he goes, Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. I understand English. I heard the words. But my job right now is to eat this pie before the ice cream melts. And if I can finish the pie about the time the ice cream finishes, that's the will of God for him. See, that's, that's all that teenager's thinking. And he's saying, do you understand? And he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you understand? Mm-hmm. I understand this is really good pie. And man, I love Bluebell. And, uh, and I understand English. So when he got through eating his pie and he got through giving him the gospel, he said, now let's just bow our heads and just repeat after me. If you understood what I said, did you understand? Mm-hmm. Good pie. That's a good story. Jesus is a good guy. Would you repeat after me this prayer? Sure, I'll pray with you. You bought me a piece of pie. And he asked Jesus to save him. And he didn't get saved until he was studying for the ministry. That's how subtle. Do you think that preacher was trying to mislead him? No. But he had been taught, if you can get somebody to that magic, the magic words, then it's automatic. It's not automatic. Except you repent. What, what does repentance look like? It looked like what was preached this morning. You start, you turn, you turn and start stepping the steps for God. You tell a young person that's living together out of matrimony that Christ uh, died for them and he expects them to repent of their sin. And what does it look like to them to put away that and to step for God and step away from that situation? And they'll either say, get out of my face, or they'll say, can you find a place for me to live? And I've had that happen. Both. And they go on for God. You find a tax collector that says, what does repentance look like? I'll pay back everybody I cheated. Not work salvation, but a repentant heart towards God, a guilty heart that is turning to God for help and willing to turn from their sin. So the Word of God is very, very, the, riches, the richness of the Word of God is it's personal. You can pick up Proverbs this week. Maybe you want to just, if you're not reading it all, just pick up uh, Whatever day it is, and go to that number of Proverbs and start reading it. And just, just say a little prayer and say, make something personal for me today. And boy, when he does, he'll show you. Maybe that's the verse you should write down, put in your pocket, put on your dashboard, and memorize it. And make it personal. Well, there's plenty of other places. The Holy Spirit comes and applies the Word of God. I can show you Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy path. God wants us to take those steps for Him in the right direction, in the right way, and we're just all the time just, eh, we're like a car out of line, always wanting to run off the road, and, and we have to keep a little, keep a little pressure on the steering wheel, because it's trying to pull to the right or pull to the left on the oncoming traffic or something, and, and, and God wants to keep us in the center and be and have a personal direction and a walk with God. Secondly, not only is the word of God personal, but it's 
path worthy. And he's talking about the path today, and he's talking about the walk today, and I said, wow. Turn with me to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Now, I really, I really believe this, and if I didn't, I don't think God would have called me into the ministry, but uh, Psalm 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and it's a light unto my path. He wants to light up the path. My brother was in Scouts just for a little time, and I remember we went to the we went to a little thing they had out at the they had a family night there at their camp or something, and we were walking down this dark path. I'll never forget this, and this is good for Pastor uh, a snake crossed the path and went not under but over my mother's foot, over the foot. And mother went over the moon. Because <laughs> it's a dark path. By the way, if you don't know, Pastor, he hates three kinds of snakes. He hates big snakes, little snakes, and sticks that look like snakes. I like that. The word, this word is a lamp unto my feet. I mean, that wasn't a pleasant experience. I was a little boy. And I'm going, why is my mother jumping so high and screaming so loud? And she said, a snake! That snake was going, a person! <laughs> and it was trying to get out of there. I could imagine that snake getting home and said, you don't believe what happened to me. I was just minding my own business. I was just slithering across the track. And this woman stuck her foot right up under my belly. And it scared me to death. If snakes could talk. That's what he would have said. Do you believe that? This word is like a lamp. And like a light. In the path that I should go. So we're going to take off this week down a path. Don't take off without the word of God. You, we're all on a good start. You, we're here. You stayed here this afternoon, the land of Nod, the sleepy time. You stayed here. You came this morning. Some came to Sunday school, Sunday school, and you heard a good message on devouring the Word of God and the steps of being in the will of God. And you're starting off great, but don't, don't, let's not put the Bible away. Let's say, you know, he wants to light my path. If this was a late night service and it was really dark outside... You wouldn't want the light to just get you halfway home. You'd want to leave your lights on all the way home. And that's what God does with His Word. It's pathworthy. Proverbs 12, 28 says, in, in His Word there is no death. But the opposite of that is there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is a way of death. So if I head out this week and I'm going to make my own choices and my own plan and my own life, then it says it's going to leave, it, something's going to die. Something's going to die. Now that means somebody's going to die. A dream might die. A testimony might die. Uh, effectiveness might die. A witness might die. Something's going to die if I just do it on my own. But there's no death in His way. Psalm 1611 says it's the path of life. And a man's life is a path of death. Psalm 2711 says it's a plain path. A plain path. God doesn't want to trick us and go, and go <laughs> look, they fell down. Boy, when Julia, when Julia runs, she's running on this gravel out here, and she goes down on her little knees, and she comes back, and she's got her skint knee. You know, that doesn't, that doesn't, well, you shouldn't have been running on the gravel. I told you not to run on the gravel. No, it hurts our heart. It hurt her little knees. 
And we grieve, and God grieves when we go running through life and falling and skinning ourselves up because we didn't walk and pray and read the plain path. Psalm 23, 5 talks about the path of, lead me in the path of righteousness. Psalm 25, 4 says, teach me thy path. I don't, I don't even know it. I'm walking some new ground. I'm learning some new paths myself. And I'm working at it. And it's great. We got help. We got vision. We've got energy to keep going for God. But there's some new things and I'm learning and Jody's learning and, and I have to do that in every part of life, but so do you. So ask God for the to teach you his path. And Psalm 25 10 says it's a path of mercy and truth but not only is the, the riches of the word personal the word of God personal and path worthy but it's precious the word of God is precious look with me in the New Testament at John chapter 1 and this is this is where I want to think this week uh, not so much, okay, I want to do more, I want to read more, uh, I want to try to up the, up the number or whatever. This is where I want, to, I want to go this week and say, you know, this, I'm going to read some things that are precious. That's what I was thinking about Wednesday night. I, it's precious to be there under, under a prepared sermon that was just a blessing. And... Chapter 1 of John says, In the beginning was the Word, capital W-O-R-D, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That'll help you a little bit with your trinity there. I mean, at least the, the deity of Christ. And we said, let us make man in our image. He's, the trinity is present but here we have at least two and he says and the word was God and the same was in the beginning with God all things were made by him the word and without him was not anything made that was made in him was life and the life was the light of men there's no question who that's talking about that's talking about Jesus Christ the word and he's the living word. And he's given us the written word. And it's precious. It's precious. And go, so go to 1 Peter chapter 2 and you'll see uh, where it says it. And I would say that probably most of us that have walked the ways with the Lord would say it's just a precious thing to know we have mercy in the morning and grace every day that's sufficient and promises, great and precious promises and a friend that's sticking closer than a brother and a plain path that's lit for us if we would choose to walk that way and look at his word. In 1 Peter chapter 2, in verse 7, it says, Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. Who is he? The Word. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builder disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. To some people, they rejected him. Go back to verse 1. Therefore, laying aside all malice and all guile, hypocrisies and envies and evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. That was in our lesson this morning about devouring the word and the desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. Watch this. If so be that ye have taken tasted that the Lord is gracious to whom cometh as unto a live, living lively stone disallowed indeed of men but chosen of God and say it precious it's, it's right there right there with the sincere book of the word desire the sincere book of the word because why because it's precious because he's precious so when you get the word you don't say I read my Bible check 
you get to go to the mailbox and open it up and go and you know that somebody took time to write you something to encourage you and it's precious and so you take the word of God and you take this this context of desire the sincere milk of the word that you might grow and say oh I want to grow I want to grow you young men better grow God may be growing a young lady out there somewhere and she she might get ahead of you you better catch up with her now as I said to y'all, watching my little granddaughter witnessing Je to Jehovah Witnesses and they're, they're gathered around her and just eating up the word as she's teaching, you know, as a little 15-year-old girl. Uh, I said, John, you better be praying for a young man somewhere around the world. And he says, I am. Keep up with Alethea. She's a precious jewel. You know why? Because she, she's excited about the things of God as a young lady. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Before the evil days come nigh. And thou shalt say, I, have, I don't have time. Oh, I've got to do so much. Young people, now is the time. Now is the time. Right now. Now is the time. And you know what it is for us that are older? Now. Because we don't know what tomorrow may hold you know we could we could have a stroke and the mind wouldn't just focus anymore it wouldn't focus anymore on the word so get it in there now because it's precious so not only is the word of God personal and it's path worthy and it's precious but it's powerful Romans 1.16, Paul said about the gospel, the word of God, describing Christ's uh, gospel. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power, the dunamis of God. It's the power of God. Turn with me to Hebrews. This was in our lesson this morning, but it's totally separate, but it is, it is the same. Um, well, I'm going the wrong way. Hebrews, back to the left just a little bit. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 in verse 12, it says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joint and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. You know, we need to handle it with care because it's like dynamite. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to get us, if we'll be honest, and we'll open up the word this week, it'll get us. It doesn't matter if we're preachers. It doesn't matter if we're missionaries. It doesn't matter if we're children. It doesn't matter if we're parents. It doesn't matter if we're husbands or wives, it doesn't matter if we're single or married, it will, it will pierce in there and help us understand the thoughts and the intents of our heart. And folks, as a Christian, we can't get along without that or we're back on our own road and our own path. So it is powerful. Look back at Hebrews chapter 1. Who at sundry times, verse 1, and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom all so he made the worlds. So you got Christ there at the creation, so you don't have a lesser, you don't have a lesser Christ as some people teach you have the creator Christ who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he hath by himself purged our sins set down at the right hand on the majesty on high by the word of his power he created the worlds but when he had by his, himself purged our sins. That's power. Power to create and power to save. You know, they ask him, who do you think you are? Who can forgive sin? Well, who can, who can, who can heal? The, who can heal? Who can bring a life? <laughs> you know, what, what's easier to do to heal somebody or to forgive their sin? Why? Because he had the power. He had the power to do it. Folks, the word of God is powerful. Don't leave that power 
out of your lives, out of our lives this week. Let's add the power. Let's, let's up the horsepower. Let's, let's up the, the oxygen intake. Let's, let's get a higher grade of fuel for our lives. Let's get the Word of God. Let's consume it. But, but as I close, I finish with this. Not only is it personal, pathworthy, precious, and powerful, but it's proven. You know, God's into proven. Okay? If you want to turn to, to Matthew... And then go back, go back a couple pages to Malachi. Malachi is uh, telling the Israelites, "You need, you need to, you need to know that I am, I am capable of being proven." A lot of people, uh, you know, is God real? Who is God? He says, "Prove it." He said, I, "He said you can prove some things." So here he's talking about uh, uh, some disobedience and so forth of Israel. And he says, uh, verse 10, he says, bring ye, all, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Now, I'm not going to take that as some preachers do and say, you know, you send you an offering to me and God will bless you and you send me some seed money and he'll bless you. I'm just going to say right here that God is prove worthy. His word is prove worthy. Now, you need to learn a lot of context about giving. Some people say, I'll give a little bit because I want to get something. And that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about you trust God, then you can prove him. And giving in Philippians, where it talks about God supplying all your needs, is a church giving collectively and, and in unity and caring for the needs and God blessing them as a group, not necessarily as an individual, although that happens. But he says, uh, prove me. Now, I don't know how I got this. I really don't know how I got this. I don't really remember any of my, my early pastors working on this very much. But somehow I got a hold as a teenager, a teenager, that everything I had belonged to God. One time I cleaned out my sock. My sock was my bank. Nobody would mess with my socks. It was, it was you know, don't touch that. And I, I got excited. I, there was, they needed a bus at the church. It's going to start a bus route. And I had some savings up. I was working a little job and going to school and playing football. And, and I was working a job. And I had saved up my extra after tithing. And I just said, I jumped in my 53 Chevrolet, which would be a classic, worth about $30,000 now, the what condition it was in. I jumped in. I, flew, I drove home. Ran, I remember I ran through the house. Mom went, phew, phew, what, what, I'm going back to church. Phew. And my church was, it was a good ways off. It was not in the neighborhood across Houston. I mean, not all the way across, but I, oh, they're still there. Oh, you know, and I pulled out a sock before I went to church. And, and I said, here, it's everything I got, put it on the bus. You know, I think in heaven I'll find out some little hearts that got pointed to Jesus because of that. And I got so excited. Just like I get excited to go to work. I'd go to work day and I was just a teenager. I didn't know. I never had a dad. My papa taught me a few things, but they'd have to show me. And they said, here, here's one of these buffers. 35 horsepower. You go through a brick wall. Here, teenager. Buff the floor. I was so glad that we did have concrete block walls. Because I would I'd get on that thing and... <laughs> and I just wish I had a video. That would have been a funny song video right there. I mean, I could have just pulling me all around that, that tile. But I got the hang of it. And I said, I'm, I'm shining the floors for Jesus. And I said, that was such a joy to my heart to get to work like that. It's for, it's for my Lord. And so I started tithing and I started giving sacrificially and my dad found out and he cussed me out for giving to God and I said dad it belongs to God 
And you won't be able to convince me that I haven't proven what he said prove. And that I haven't seen God bless all through my life. When I got my graduation, I walked across having paid my bills in full. And God gave me jobs, unusual jobs, great jobs. But not only have I personally feel like I've proven it to some degree, but we close by going to Hebrews chapter 11. And time, time doesn't allow us, but if you want to, if you want to start somewhere to read a blessing this week, if you want to read some people that paid the price, that, uh, that it cost them to have faith. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So we're back to the riches of the word. So I get the word of God in. One of the products is my faith is going to grow. And if you read this chapter 11, it starts out saying, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. And the evidence of things not seen. This world needs evidence. These people are these people are moving in around here. I mean, they they're just they're just blowing dust down or tearing up our road. They're just just building all around us here. It's just, this is people. I'm, I've got a real good friend. Ah, oh, it's time to move now. Get out of here. This is why we came. And these are souls, and these people, they're going to have problems, and boy, they're going to have pressures, and, and to be paying for these houses, and, uh, and we're here. And God sent us here. And these people in Hebrews chapter 11 have proved what faith is, and they proved the Word of God that built their faith. And you just read it. Some were killed. Some were cut asunder. Some lived in caves. They didn't all. They weren't all prosperity gospel. They wouldn't have fit. They wouldn't have fit downtown in Joel's church. They wouldn't have fit because they lost everything they had. They gave everything they had. They gave. They gave it up, and they didn't get mad about it. They. They caught it. They. It. it but here's what, it, here's what this chapter ends with. It's like, it says, and these, look at verse 39, and these all having obtained a good report, that's what they got, was a good report. <laughs> Through faith, receive not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. It's like they took a baton, you know, they're running a race, and they're, and they're, and they're saying, we, we, we suffered, we, we died, we, we paid the greatest price for, for this faith. And now, as we're running, as we're running here, take it, take it, church. And we reach back, and it says, without us should not be made perfect. The story's not over unless we take this baton of the truths of God's Word and live it out and prove it. And then a verse is kind of scary, Pastor Rogers, in Hebrews 6, uh, I think 12, somewhere in there, it says, follow those who through faith and patience have inherited the promises. We both started pretty young as pastors, but through time now, we've both proven God. And it's okay to say, you know, don't follow me in everything because I'm still learning some things. But there's some things we know and it says, follow those who through faith and patience, from the word of God, faith comes by hearing the word, it's precious, have inherited the promises. Take up the baton of, of the Hebrews 11 saints that died for their faith, that were drawn and quartered, that were tied to animals and pulled apart. He said, you take up the baton and you say, I, to this generation, will prove 
by faith, what I learn from the Word of God, from the preachers of the Word of God, what I, what I see and what I, God leads me in, I will prove. Because this Word is a proven book, folks. So here's what I'm asking as I close this week. Whatever you're doing, I'm reading this much or I'm doing this much or I kind of used to memorize or I kind of used to read more than I'm doing or just wherever you are, just take another step and, and cherish the Word of God and look for the letter, look for the love letter from God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have some things for us new every morning. You have your promises that are precious. You have your person, personal, personal Savior we have. Not a, not a corporate Savior, not a Baptist Savior, not a, uh, a parent Savior, but we have a personal Savior. And if there's somebody here that's never clearly submitted and committed their life to Christ in repentance saying I, I know I know I, I know I'm not perfect because it would take perfection and there is none righteous no not one and it takes humility and it takes submitting to the righteousness of God that his his plan was to send his son to die in our place and if there's anyone here they know about God they've talked about God they believe in God but they don't have the fruit of the walk with God there's not a tug to, to follow those steps that he said this morning those are clear steps those are biblical steps and if there's not a tug in the heart to say I, I need to make I need the next step and we need to make sure that we have the Spirit of God in us and not, the, not our own spirit with a little religion tacked on. The difference will be eternity. So Father, I pray for the souls of our folks here and our friends and family. And I pray for everyone here, for all of us, including myself, to say this, this week I want to I wanna read your letter. I want to I wanna, <laughs> I wanna see how much you love me. I want to follow your path. I want you to light my way. And I need to read the word to do that. And maybe give me a verse to write down to just meditate on. Lord, I pray right now, hearts are saying, I, I'm in. I'm going to do it. I'm going to take another step to please my Savior. And I'll thank you, Lord. For all you've done and I thank you Lord for what you're gonna do but to be honest father every one of us needs to take a step and every one of us needs to go forward and not sideways or backwards with humility saying help me Lord to not be a drag on the Spirit of God working in this place help me not to grieve the Spirit Help me to follow those who through faith and patience have inherited the promises. And we'll just humbly ask this now because that's a fearful verse. But we want to see this place honoring you and reaching souls. So Lord, I do pray that you'll move our hearts to take a step in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, this week, if you'll be praying, uh, the, the rest of the concrete goes in Monday or Tuesday, depending on the weather report. And thankfully, we're the farther side of the, 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 the clean side, so we just would rather the rain stay away for another day or two until we get all the roof on the trailer. And the concrete will go in, and then we'll work on the, the gates and... Uh, just be praying. It's a big project. We're, we're not only doing the barn dominium, but we're doing the trailer. And that's a double duty. That's a double, double duty. Okay. And so uh, we've, gutted, we've gutted it out where it leaked. And there'll still be other places to repair. We want to do windows and some siding on that. So it's a, it's a big job. Pray for wisdom. And I'm sure thankful uh, missionary Brother Terry's with us. <laughs> Amen. And uh, 
So, Pastor, if you would close this. Up.